The Incas by Nigel Davies Chapter 6 The Empire and Its Infrastructure A Diverse Pattern Many traces of the Incas presence throughout their empire have now been located and studied. Archaeological research denotes the existence of a complex infrastructure and suggests a pattern of orderly control. Instinctively, therefore, the temptation may arise to think of this great domain, stretching from slightly north of the equator almost to a latitude of 35 degrees south, as a basically homogeneous realm subject to a strictly uniform system of imperial rule. But in reality, each newly added province was hardly set in the precise mold of those already subdued in order to forge a more or less monolithic whole subjected to a single set of rules. Craig Morris, in suggesting that some kind of grand master plan might have been placed by the time of the conquest, denies that such a plan would have aimed at reducing the Inca's domain to some easy administrative common denominator. The brilliance of their achievements perhaps lay more in their ability to accept, use, and even foster diversity. Hence, factors such as the ecology of a given territory, the culture of its people, and the, and the length of time since it was first conquered apparently led to marked differences in the way each was governed. In the very broadest terms, the Inca Empire did indeed adhere to a single ecological pattern. Throughout most of its extent, the coast was desert or semi-desert. The Ecuadorian littoral was never subdued. The immediate hinterland rose steeply to the Altiplano, surmounted by the Andean Cordillera, and then descended gradually into tropical and subtropical plains, penetrated only at certain places by the Inca forces. In the next chapter, specific aspects of imperial rule will be considered. The established gro governing hierarchy, the division of land, the imposition of taxes levied in the form of labor or produce, and the urge for local self-sufficiency whereby certain communities would form s settlements at different altitudes, the concept described by Murrah uh, as verticality. But as a prelude to any such assessment of an empire so diverse, certain other basic questions first require attention. The cultural and ecological characteristics of each principal region, and the, and the extent to which they differed, the effect of such diversity on the Inca pattern of control, and the kind of centers from which the Incas ruled their empire. In addition, before studying the administration of this huge and heterogeneous domain, the, f the physical means of control in terms of both civil and military infrastructure need to be considered. Leaving aside for the moment the northern and southern extremities of the empire, the basic domain might be said to consist of the core territory of the central Andes together with Colau and the Peruvian littoral. Both the north sector, previously subject to the kingdom of Chimur, and the coastal region further to the south, previously controlled by a number of separate principalities, Colau. The traditional importance of Kolasuyu, the region surrounding Lake Titicaca, has already been stressed, and although the splendors of the Tibonaco civilization have long since faded, many tales bear witness to close links between Kolau and the Incas' legendary past. Certain sources, moreover, imply that the Kolas play a positive role in the creation of the Inca state under Pachacutec. Lumbreras, in writing of the Chanca War, referred to these Aymara-speaking principalities as major participants in the struggle to secure an Inca victory. He further views the valley of Cusco and the Titicaca Altiplano as interdependent regions. Shado also writes of an Inca alliance with the Lupaca sometime before the confrontation with the Chancas, though he sees this alliance as excluding the Colas, whose realm also lay on the northern flank of late Titicaca. The Lupaca system of dual chieftainship might also have prevailed in the Proto-Inca state. Notwithstanding any such prior links on the basis of equality between Colas and Incas, Pachacutec in the early stages of Inca long-range expansion imposed his will on the Colas by force, defeating in battle the lord of Hatun Cola and, and annexing his kingdom. This appears to have been an extensive domain embracing almost the entire Lake Titicaca region. Accepting the Pacajes territory south of the lake, and possibly the Lupaca polity. The Inca administration of the region is described in some detail in the Visita Hecha a la Provincia de Chucuito por Garce Díaz de San Miguel, written in 1557. Chucuito was the capital of the Lupaca chiefdom and was situated a few miles south of Puno on the shore of Lake Titicaca. According to this document, as cited by Mura, the area occupied by Aymara-speaking groups was then much greater than today, and its inhabitants could be counted at least in the hundreds of thousands. And the Lupaca alone numbered more than 20,000 households, or about 100,000 souls. 
Garcia Diaz writes of the dual control of the Lupacas by two rulers, Garri and Cusin, named by Siesa and other chroniclers in describing the Inca conquest. Certain sources denounce these Lupaca kings as mere rebels who, f who frequently rose against their Inca masters, whereas others portray them as loyal subjects who helped to govern the whole region. Though Chiquito became the main provincial capital, Hatun Cola also de developed as an important Inca center. As Catherine Julian writes, the Inca town would have been laid out on a typical grid plan with shrines that corresponded to the O's of Cusco. This pattern involved a town center with many Inca buildings, including not only a temple of the state religion, but also a multitude of storehouses, as well as a convent of women cho chosen by the Inca government. Hislop carried out a surface rec reconnaissance of Chiquito and four other Lupaca centers of population. Evidence from surface ceramics would suggest that these communities were probably founded at about the time of the Inca occupation. The development of such urban centers would have furthered the Inca aim of pressing the Colas to abandon villages situated at or near the mountaintops and to concentrate it in the plains below, a process described by Siesa. The chronicler, in writing of Colau, confirms that in pre-Inca times, the inhabitants lived in fortified settlements on the high peaks from which they would emerge to make war on each other, inflicting heavy casualties and seizing many captives for sacrifice. Few traces of Inca settlement have been found outside the cultivated zones of the plain, and any vestiges of occupation of other parts of the Lupaca region date from pre-Inca times. Copacabana retained its aura of sanctity. Amalia Castelli compares its significance as a shrine to that of Pachacamac, and cites Calancha as relating that Tupac Inca introduced carefully selected mitomes to guard the precincts and supervise the flow of pilgrims. The relationship between Cusco and Cola was indeed complex. Cola contingents fought v valiantly in imperial campaigns, particularly in Ecuador, but sources that report Cola rebellions in Tupac's time also mention other uprisings as late as the reign of Huayna Capac. These might, in reality, have occurred at an, an earlier date. Alternatively, they could, they could have been directed against Cola rulers loyal to the Inca, who then appealed to the latter for help in crushing such dissent. The South Coast Another early objective of Inca expansionism was the series of thriving principalities on the south coast of present-day Peru, lying west and southwest of Cusco and extending northward to the approximate southern boundary of the Kingdom of Chimor. Siesa reports an early expedition by Pachacutec along the Cuntisuyu Road, where he met fierce resistance. Cobo also mentions this campaign, in which the ruler received a mixed reception. In the southernmost valleys of Ica and Nazca, he faced little resistance, but further to the northwest, Huarco fought fiercely against the invaders. The Chincha policy, polity rather, was among the strongest and most important on the southern coast. According to Siesa, when Tupac Inca later proceeded down the coast after conquering Chimor, the Chinchas, together with the people of Nazca, initially resisted his advance, though a peaceful surrender ensued. Inca domination led to the presence of imperial officials in the Chincha Valley, the establishment of an administrative center in their capital, the building of a temple to the sun, and the cession of land for the settlement of Mitomes. Much land throughout the region was evidently taken for these settlers, and many of the original inhabitants were relocated in other parts of the empire, where they came to be well known for their skills as potters and silversmiths. The Caraca of Chincha retained a status of great prestige in the imperial hierarchy, when Pizarro met Atahualpa in Gajamarca, he was the only other dignitary present to be born in a litter. Though certain principalities reportedly offered little or no resistance to Tupac, a grimmer fate awaited the, the Huarcos, the Chincha's northerly neighbors who occupied the, lo the lower part of the Cañete Valley. Far from suing for peace, they fortified their territory and prepared to fight to the end. In Siesta's description of their ordeal, they struggled on for three years. Finally, de debilitated by this war of, att of attrition, the Huarcos surrendered, and the chiefs and many others were, were massacred. The chronicler refers to great piles of bones still visible in his day. Farther to the north, the central sector of the Peruvian coast, extending as far as the border of the kingdom of Chimur, had been dominated by two principalities, Yichma, which included the Lima Valley, and Colique, north of present-day Lima, astride the valley of the Rio Chilon. The surviving sites of 
Cajamarquilla and Pachacamac were both then situated in Ichma. Under Inca rule, the latter finally retained its prestige, and when Tupac conquered the Ichma Valley, he gave the, sh the shrine its present name. By contrast, Cajamarquilla, which had become a major settlement during the Middle Horizon, probably declined before the end of this period. Ruth Shady describes Cajamarquilla as having been the largest and most important town of the Central Coast. The religious aura of Pachacamac needs no stressing. It was famed for its, influ its influence and wealth, attracting pilgrims from, from regions far distant. The Spaniards were impressed by Pachacamac. Pedro Pizarro relates that Atahualpa told Francisco Pizarro of the great store of golden treasure owned by its idol. Francisco de Xeres offers a dramatic description of its riches, stating that pilgrims visited the site from a distance of up to 300 leagues bearing gold and silver gifts. Pachacamac was held in such esteem that Siesa describes Tupac's occupation more as a ceremonial visit, involving a consultation with the oracle, than as a conquest. Cobo tells how, when Juana Capac was about to die of smallpox, his servants sent two relay teams to the shrine to ask what should be done for the health of their lord. The oracle replied through the mouth of an idol that the Inca should be taken out into the sun and that he will then get well. The advice was carefully followed, but with the opposite result. When the Inca was exposed to the sun, he died at once. Of the principality of Colique, north of Ichma, Wost Robowski bases her description on documents that she discovered in the, Ar in the Archivo de Indias in Seville. Before the arrival of the Incas, the ruler controlled many lesser Caracas and even at one time occupied part of the Lima Valley. When Tupac conquered Colique, he met with stiff resistance, and its ruler was killed in a hard-fought battle. These maritime principalities, reportedly conquered by Tupac, collectively came to form an important part of the Inca Empire. It was valuable not only for their unique sanctity of Pachacamac, but also because this was the sector of the Pacific Coast most accessible to the Inca capital. From, from an agricultural standpoint, the two settlements offered to highland communities the possibility of vertical expansion to lands at lower altitudes, ideal for the cultivation of the much prized coca. The peoples of these ancient sites were not only noted for their skills as artisans, especially as silversmiths and potters. A document in the library of the Royal Palace in Madrid states that in the Chincha Valley there were 10,000 fishermen. Russ Robowski, in agreeing that this figure might seem exaggerated, never, nevertheless points out that fish was not only an item of local consumption, but was also used in dried form for the purposes of barter with the peoples of the Sierra. Chimor at the time of its conquest by the Incas, the great kingdom of Chimor occupied the full extent of the northern coast of Peru, stretching south from Tumbes to the limits of the Rio Chion Valley. In, re in recent times, much has been written about Chimor, of which in this context a brief account may suffice. Its capital, Chan Chan, sprang from ancient traditions. Kent Day cites evidence of a clear line of continuity between the Chimu and the Moche cultures. In particular, this continuity is implicit in Larker Hoyle's study of Mochica iconography, suggesting that basic features of Moche government law and class structure resembled closely those included by Rowe in a summary of Chimu ethno history. The state and society of the Incas, relative newcomers, might in certain respects have been influenced both by the coastal kingdoms described earlier and, in particular, by Chimur. Long before the rise of Cusco, Chimor ranked among the most complex urban centers of the Andean region, endowed with an elaborate system of irrigation on which it depended for much of its food supply. Chimor, probably the largest single polity conquered by the Incas, was no more bound realm already set on the road to ruin. On the contrary, it was actively extending its bounds at the very time Inca expansion was gaining momentum. One of Chimor's later acquisitions had been Lambayeque, the realm of a powerful Nanchimu dynasty. Lambayeque lay astride the river of that name, some 200 kilometers north of Chanchan. Chan. As Hislop explains, many great monuments and rich artifacts usually ascribed to the Chimu are really the product of the classic Lambayeque culture that flourished from the 9th to the 14th century. Ro, in his Kingdom of Chimur, offered an informative analysis of the Chimu state. At its greatest extent, reaching from Tumbes to 
Caballo on the Chion River, which marks the northern edge of the valley, the kingdom stretched for more than 620 miles as the crow flies. The highland valleys before the Inca conquest contained a small number of tribes. All were poor and weak, with the exception of the people of Gajamarca, who became allies of Chimor. As Roe affirms, by far the most important source for the history of Chimor is the anonymous history of Trujillo, written in 1604, of which the fragmentary first chapter contains a brief summary of Chimor's past. According to this source, the founder of the kingdom, Taikanamo, arrived on a big raft. It was the grandson of, his, of this legendary figure, Nansenpinko, who really laid the foundations of the kingdom, controlling a part of the coast that stretched for a distance of about 125 miles. Seven kings succeeded Nansenpinko prior to the time of Minchan Kaman, or Minchan Saman, who ruled at the time of the Inca assault. This monarch, the Chimo Kapak of the Inca chroniclers, was among the greatest of the Chimu conquerors. The anonymous history merely states that he dominated the entire coast from Tumbes to Carabaylo. However, according to Roe, other sources suggest that Lambayeque to the north was probably conquered by this ruler's predecessor. The Chimu advance northward reached as far as the limits of the desert coast, but in the south it seems to have been halted by powerful resistance in the, in the Lima Valley. More recently, researchers have sought to seek a closer correlation between the findings of archaeology and the somewhat fragmentary reports of traditional sources that Roe tended to view as mythical. Alan Colada identifies the earlier era of Chimu expansion with the reign of Nansenpinko, in which he suggests spanned the period between 80, 1150, and 1200. Colada proposes that the second great phase of military expansion, the conquest of Lambayeque in the, in, in the north, began between 1300 and 1370. With the annexation of this great province, ad additional wealth began to flow into the capital and triggered a new and vigorous program of construction. The Nilamp dynasty of Lambaye Lambayeque, according to the account given by Cabello de, de, Bab de Baboa, arrived in the Lambayeque Valley on a fleet of rafts. Nine descendants of Nilamp, according to Cabello, subsequently ruled Lambayeque. The last of these descendants, Fempe Fempelec, reigned some time before the kingdom was conquered by Timur. It is interesting to note that an apparently independent account of this story of Nilamp and his first successor, Sium, recorded by Father Justo Rubinos y Andrade in 1781, nearly 200 years after Cabello, gives certain details not included in the latter's version. Christopher, Christopher Donan further suggests that the Nilamp tradition could conceivably rate to much earlier times, even preceding the time of Wadi influence on the north coast during the Middle Horizon. Field work in recent decades has added much to our knowledge of Chan Chan, a capital whose grandeur bears witness to the power of the Chimor realm. Built during the course of the late intermediate period, AD 1000 to 1400, the city covers 24.5 square kilometers. Outstanding among its remains are the 10 north-facing compounds, or ciudadelas. Their original purpose is still not absolutely clear, though Conrad and others are convinced that they were the palaces of the Chimu kings. Storerooms were found in large numbers in the 10 ciudadelas, though specific data on kinds and amounts of stored goods are lacking. Certain structures used for storage appear to be similar to those of the Incas. As we have already seen, the sources' accounts of the Inca conquest of Timur are cursory and contradictory. They do scant justice to one of the most dazzling, if not the most daunting, chapters in the annals of Inca military triumphs. Camelo owns that he is unable to affirm whether the, whether the army, which was commanded by Tupac's two uncles and descended upon Timur from the north, met with stubborn resistance or whether Timur yielded without a fight. In the case of Chimur, a state that had swallowed others by force of arms in, f in, f in fairly recent times, any abject surrender tends to lack credibility. Moreover, the ruler was carried off to Cajamarca and eventually to Cusco, and it seems doubtful that such a, a rich and potent monarch would submit without a fight to this de degrading fate. Siasa briefly describes an intense str struggle between Chimur's forces and Tupac's army from the north, in which the latter at one point was in danger of annihilation. That one Inca force, after a grueling march, 
could in a single encounter destroy such a mighty kingdom, their only potential rival in the, in the north, seems remarkable enough in itself, yet any notion that the surrender was voluntary is harder to accept. Shadell goes so far as to suggest that Chimor's inner and outer defense works were probably the Magano line of their day. The Inca conduct toward Timur was not altogether benign. The conquered domain was mercilessly looted, and some of the gold sent to Cusco was used to make a great band of precious metal that extended around the wall of the Temple of the Sun in Coricancha. Nonetheless, in general terms, the Inca's treatment of their new conquest is commended by Roa Shrewd. The vanquished ruler was kept secluded in Cusco, and his son mounted the Chimu throne as an Inca puppet succeeded in turn by his son and grandson. However, any pretense of power still exercised by such phantom rulers was gradually eroded. The Incas installed each son of such rulers as hereditary lord of a town or valley, which thus succeed, succeeded from the, from the original kingdom. The significance of the conquest lay in the excellence of Chimu organization and culture, perhaps exceeding those of any state yet taken by the Incas. We know too little about the government of Chimur to be sure just what aspects the Inca borrowed, if any. One possible feature was the system of rule the hereditary local nob nobility. The political organization of the Inca Empire seems to have been established by Tupac after the defeat of Chimur. With regard to style and culture, the Incas perhaps adopted from Chimur certain techniques of, metal of metallurgy and featherwork. The paucity of Inca-style buildings or artifacts in this region bears witness to the conqueror's respect for the refinements of Chimu culture and a consequent reluctance to impose their own. By archaeological evidence alone, it would be hard to establish an Inca period in the area in contrast to the great constru constructions and copious amounts of pure Inca pottery present, say, in Pachacamac. Inca-influenced artifacts are indeed present in Janjan, though not in great abundance. Moreover, the existing infrastructure was so impressive that the Inca state saw little need to create new centers or roads. The Chimus apparently did not use the Inca Kipu. Netherly confirms that the more recent excavations failed to reveal concentrations of Inca ceramics in the region, any demand for which was affected by the prestige of the local potters. During the period of Inca occupation, pottery in the Chimur Valley continued to display the typical Chimu stylistic elements. A hybrid Chimu Inca style did develop, but is mainly to be found outside the valley of Chimur itself, suggesting a profound Inca appreciation of Chimu ceramics and the potters who produced them. However deep the Inca's respect for Chimu's culture, they ruled the kingdom with a firm hand, notwithstanding any initial pretense of, auto of autonomy. Extensive lands were surrendered to the crown, and local nobles were obliged to house Inca officials. The kingdom was exposed to the rigors of the Mitame system, and Ciesa writes that many highly skilled artisans were deported to the valley of Cusco. Others were evidently sent to the Cajabarca area, where, Fernando de la Carrera writes, groups of people still spoke the Muchic language in the early 17th century. The Homeland The occupation of highland Ecuador, northwest Argentina, and north and central Chile has been reviewed in earlier chapters in the core regions, regions rather, of the empire, Colau, Timor, and the south coast, are described above. However, certain characteristics of the central highlands of the present-day Peru, the very heartland of the Inca realm, still remain to be considered. In the late intermediate period, prior to the rise of Cusco, this extensive highland region was divided into a number of warlike principalities, of which the larger generally sought to dominate their smaller neighbors. Once conquered, a principality came under the control of one of a number of Inca administrative centers. Among the leading centers of this type was Cajamarca. It has since been the object of much archaeological research, as has Huamachuco, an important place about a hundred kilometers to the south. The Cajamarca Huamachuco area was a highly developed part of the central Andean region before it was absorbed into the empire. Cajamarca itself remained important in Inca times and is described by many early sources. Research in Cajamarca has uncovered certain pre-Inca remains, but has located only one Inca structure and small quanti quantities rather, of Inca pottery. The Inca structure was the famous ransom room, Cuarto de Rescate, which is said to have been filled with gold. As Hislop points out, 
Inca Cajamarca did not survive the violent events of the early Spanish conquest, and by Siesta's time, the Inca buildings and storehouses were already torn apart and ruined. Similarly, in other leading highland centers such as Bonbon and Chaucha, described as thriving cities at the time of the conquest, view vestiges of the Inca past have been recovered. In marked contrast to Cajamarca, the important administrative center of Juanuco Pampa has in recent years yielded copious information. The site stretches over an area of two square kilometers. 3,500 structures are still visible and 497 storehouses with an estimated cap capacity of more than a million bushels have been located. The city, which is among the best preserving provincial sites, consists of four zones sur surrounding a large central plaza crossed by the principal road in a north-south direction. Craig Morris and Donald Thompson, in the account of their excavations of Juan Nuco Pampa, writes both of the, st of the storage area and of residential districts in the north and south barrios with typical Inca rectangular buildings. These bear no resemblance to the domestic architecture of local ethnic groups, and the pottery found was also Inca-inspired. In another context, Morris states that one can archaeologically dis distinguish Inca state establishments from dwellings of local groups. Not only are they more methodically planned, they are also of more recent cons construction. The nature of some such establishments suggests their use as, ac as accommodations for a transient population, possibly connected with military service. As, a, as an example apart from Juan Nuco, one may cite, one may cite Pumpu, an Inca administrative center south of Juan Nuco. Juan Nuco is of special significance because, apart from reports by Siesa and other chroniclers, it was described by Ortiz de Zuniga, whose visit took place in 1562. De Zuniga's account contains many references to the delivery of Juanuco Pampa su of supplies of food and to, the man and to the many storehouses. Of those already identified, more than 100 have been excavated, and it was found that, appro that approximately 38,000 cubic meters of storage space, a large portion, was used to hold food. Mura and Morris also note that, notwithstanding the reports of Siesa and others on the role of Inca prov provincial centers, Archaeological research at Juanico Pampa revealed little evidence of any military functions. In contrast to Juan, to Juanico, which like Cajamarca existed in pre-Inca pre times, centers and other highland valleys were constructed by the Incas themselves, serving imperial personnel on a, ro on a rotating basis. In such centers, the greater part of the, po of the population would still be of local origin. These places in one way or another mirrored certain facets of Cusco. Many buildings were recognizably like those of the Cusco heartland, and some used pottery in the style of the capital. The road system linked them together. Morris described such centers as resembling miniature state enclaves scattered over a landscape originally controlled by other polities. Characteristic of such sites is Inca Huasi, situated 28 kilometers inland from the coast in the Cañete Valley. The layout, as described by Hislop, involved a symbolic design based, like Cusco itself, on the division into four suyus. Parts of Cusco's formal blueprint may have been introduced. The apparent integration of important Inca astronomical sight lines into the plan of Inca Huasi suggests the presence of calendrical symbolism in the layout of the town, as also proposed by Morris in the case of Huanuco. As an example of such integration, the alignment of much of the architectural remains argues that the rise of Azimuth of the Pleiades, of such significance in Cusco, was also was important also in the design of the center of Inca Huasi. Duccio Bonavia even maintains that the Incas were not basically builders of major cities, though he stopped short of arguing that no urban centers were built in Tawantinsuyu. The Incas preferred to occupy the living sites of the groups they annexed and only built new settlements when obliged to do so for the special purpose of establishing control in, strat in strategic places. These centers inv invariably included such typical components as a plaza, a principal palace, and a temple of the sun almost always found in sites, though certain elements have pre-Inca antecedents. In instances where an existing town was adopted as a provincial capital, it would be partly remodeled to conform to the Inca pattern. Typical of this tendency were Cajamarca and Pachacamac. In Pachacamac, 
many buildings now visible were constructed centuries before the Incas, who built the Temple of the Sun and the Pilgrim's Plaza. Inca methods of control may include a natural predilection for high land as opposed to lowland settlements. This preference seems to have governed their policy toward not only Chimor, but also the smaller chiefdoms of the coast. In northern Peru, the Incas tended to base their major controlling centers in the neighboring highlands, to which the nearby coastal peoples were then subordinated. Huancayo Alto may be cited as an example. Discovered by Dillahay in 1976, this highland site is located on the Rio Chilon, about 50 kilometers inland from the coast and from the important principality of Colique. Unlike most Inca centers found on the coast, Huancayo Alto is comparatively large, with Inca type structures and elitist dwellings. Finally, a notable aspect of Inca rule is the apparent absence of the, the larger type of administrative centers in the distant marches of the empire south of Cochabamba, which, according to various sources, was itself a most important Inca center, situated in a rich valley and inhabited by numerous mitomes. This absence of large sites in the southern part of the empire raises the question of whether the Inca may have been capable, at least for a given period, of, of ruling vast areas without the necessity of massive urban development. Though Tupac Inca reportedly conquered Cochabamba, the whole province was only consolidated and recognized in his successor's reign, leaving a rather limited time for urban development before the empire collapsed. Among the more notable surviving sites in the Cochabamba region are the Inca, are the Inca Racay and Inca Lacta. Inca Racay was investigated in 1967 by, Tr by Trimborn, whose description suggests that it, it was as much a fortress as a place of residence. Bern de Caballero terms this an administrative ritual military site. Norkin's, Norden's Cold, writing of Inca Lacta as long ago as 1915, describes a palace with thick walls but refers to the place mainly as a fortress. Farther south, major Inca centers are notably absent. Though many of their vis though many vestiges of their occupation sur survive, when the Incas settled in local towns, they merely adapted them to suit their re their residential and administrative needs. For instance, nothing in northwest Argentina can be rem can even remotely be compared with Ecuadorian Tumebamba. Fine Inca stone masonry has been found as north as as Calo about 65 kilometers south of, of Quito. But the southernmost extension of such st stonework is, l is less certain. Though apparently absent in Argentina and Chile, some remains of this type exist just south of Lake Titicaca, but none are found in the numerous Inca sites in the vicinity of Cochabamba. The Communication System Fundamental, fundamental to the control of an empire of such dimensions, embracing such varied and intractable terrain, was infrastructure. In this respect, the Inca's crowning achievement was their road network, which included staging posts and ample storage faci facilities. Admittedly, the Incas were not the first Andean road builders. Colin Bex's study, Ancient Roads on the North Coast of Peru, described many segments of pre-Inca roads in that region, some even thought to date to Chavin times. Hislop offers much evidence of the existence of pre-Inca roads, including some built in the Huati period. The Incas are not known to have invented specific techniques, but their true innovation was the extension of formal road building into many regions where it was formerly unknown. Many Inca roads are still intact, and some have been described in fairly recent times by explorer v Victor von Hagen and, uh, and others. The Inca Road Project, carried out between 1978 and 1981 under the direction of Hislop, ranks among the more notable achievements in Andean studies. In this context, one can only offer brief comments, which can hardly do justice to Hislop's detailed account. The full extent of the system will never be known, as some roads have physically disappeared. Nonetheless, the Inca Road Project collected much new data, and it would not be surprising if future archaeological and historical surveys could properly document a network of up to 40,000 kil kilometers. Some roads fall into special categories. For example, some served religious ends and led to high altitude sanctuaries, usually well above 5,000 meters. Others were constructed for military purposes as a link with, with frontier fortresses. However, 
Most roads were built mainly for administrative and economic purposes. The highland and coastal arteries connected the, the principal local and or Inca centers in the Andes and were used by officials and technicians. The road crossing the Atacama Desert and connecting Cusco with central Chile belongs to this category. It would have had limited military importance because water on the route was too scarce. Roads serving economic ends were used to, to transport basic supplies such as metals, foodstuffs, and textiles from the areas where they were produced to Inca centers and to the capital itself. The lateral routes that connected the highlands with the eastern and western valleys were also important as economic links, facilitating the exchange of products between varied environmental zones. The roads to the eastern forest also had economic significance. Apart from their military use as a connection to frontier fortresses, they led to zones where wood, coca, wax, honey, feathers, and drugs were secured. Of all Inca roads, however, the most important was the Cusco-Quito Highland Route. Many large Inca centers lay on it, and no road in the empire was consistently as wide. Its minimum width was generally 3 meters and its maximum 16 meters. Numerous descriptions survived, as many early Spanish travelers used it. Inca road builders faced problems involving vastly different types of terrain. Coastal arteries built on a sand surface needed no formal const construction. Those built over rock required construction only when they confronted steep slopes. Many roads, both in mountains and lowlands, pass through agricultural land. These are characterized by sidewalks used, according to the early written sources, to protect crops from travelers and animals. The height of such walls was usually one or two meters, su sufficient to serve as a real rather than symbolic barrier. On the Pacific coast, the sidewalls tend to be made of tapia, whereas in the mountains they were generally of stone. Certain roads included stretches that were liable to flood and required stone paving over a limited distance. Others crossed long stretches of solid or nearby or, ne or nearly solid rock. These, invari these invariably lacked sidewalls as no crops were cultivated in such areas. Hislop devotes an interesting chapter to bridges. Many of these were fairly simple log structures placed on abutments of rough or fine stone masonry. But what so impressed the early Spaniards were the suspension bridges with filter superstructures. These were apparently new to the Europeans, and their first crossings on such swaying de devices were made with intense trepidation. Suspension bridges could span considerable distances, but needed continual maintenance and frequent reconst reconstruction. In addition to the, sus to the suspension bridges, the Incas at some river crossings employed the arroya, a device usually consisting of a blanket suspended from a cable connected to both sides of the river and pulled from one side to the other by people on one bank who hauled a rope attached to the basket. The tampu, the, ro the roadside lodging and storage areas cited, according to various sources at a day's walk apart, formed an integral part of the road network. Though the tampu was a typical feature of the imperial system, growing evidence of the, of the existence of pre-Inca roads and installations built on them suggests that these waysides were not an Inca invention. Comparable structures continued to be in use in colonial times, and the Spaniards even expanded their use beyond the borders of Tahuantinsuyu. The main architectural element of the tampu was the cancha, a rectangular walled compound enclosing a number of one-room structures. A major purpose of tampu was the storage and safekeeping of arms, clothing, fuel, and, f and foodstuffs essential to the functioning of the empire. Early sources tell little about activities at the tampu apart from, st from storage and, lo and lodging, but these establishments clearly also served for craft pr production and played a part in, lo in local administration as well as in ceremonial and military affairs. In contrast to the more solidly built tampu, Chosky posts are difficult for investigators to, lo to locate. These stations were placed at short intervals along certain roads as part of the system of relay runners who passed messages and small objects over great distances in a matter of days. According to Ciesa, who describes them, Chosky's were houses made of wood and thatch rather than of durable ma materials and were occupied by two men drawn from the local population. These individuals were sworn to the strictest secrecy concerning the messages they bore. As Hislop observes, in the absence of any form of writing, verbal messages were employed, though quipus were also passed. 
and these perhaps ran the risk of becoming garbled when repeated many times over from one chasqui to another. Military Infrastructure The superb communication system was invaluable, if not essential, for long-range military operations. Also of great importance were Inca fortifications. In many regions, forts constituted such an integral part of the military infrastructure that their strategic importance into Inca times might almost be compared to that of, of castles in European warfare during the Middle Ages. Moreover, Siesa affirms that the prior to the rise of the Incas, many groups lived on fortified hilltops from which they made frequent sallies to pillage their neighbors and to take captives. In the same chapter, incidentally quoted word for word by Garcilasco, Siesa also writes of the numerous forts built by the Incas in conquered provinces. It might be added that the erection of fortifications is a, is a most ancient practice in the annals of Andean warfare. Mosley describes Chanquilo in the Cosmo Valley to the north of Lima as among the most spectacular of ancient keeps, yielding radiocarbon dates as old as 342 BC. It has three concentric walls of masonry. A distinction needs to be made between forts at key points within the empire used to control lands already conquered and those situated in frontier zones as a protection against external aggression. Our overall knowledge of Inca frontier forts is limited, as none have been found in the eastern border regions of Peru, though some data are available from Chile in the south and Ecuador in the north. In addition, certain sites within the empire that include fort fortresses such as Inca Lacta and Inca Bracay in the Cochabamba region have already been mentioned. Rafino describes nine posts in southern Bolivia that were not necessarily forts, but that formed a kind of protective chain to guard the eastern frontier. He lists other defensive sites in, north in northwestern Argentina. However, without a more exact notion of where the frontier lay, it might be hard to say to what, to what extent these were in fact frontier posts. Rafino does, however, also mention forts in, Ch in Chile near the Rio Male, and these might have served to protect a frontier, as this river, as we have seen, is often described by sources as the southern limit of the empire. Alberto Rex Gonzalez also gives a comprehensive list of sites in northwestern Argentina, complete with map. He cites Pucara de Andagala, also known as Aconquija, as a good example of a frontier fortress situ situated at a strategic locale. This site is surrounded by walls three, kil <laughs> three kilometers in length, and the structures within them are described as large and important. There is no evidence of any pre-Inca occupation. Polo de Ondegardo, writing in 1571, mentions forts in central Chile, but to judge from their location, these would not seem to be frontier posts. Similar doubts arise concerning Ecuador, where to the north of Quito fortified sites abound. Solomon describes both Quito and Ota and Otavalo as having undergone a transition a few years before the conquest from defensive citadels to elite ceremonial and administrative centers. In both areas, the Inca domain was seemingly shielded to the immediate east by fortresses of rustic construction overlooking the aboriginal communities of the, of the, of the valleys. At the borders of the highland basins, chains of forts apparently used during the Incaic Wars dominated the, the slopes of the transverse and eastern mountain ranges. However, the western slopes do not seem to have been similarly fortified. The, the, the relative openness of the western mountain boundaries might be attributable to a state of peaceful interaction with lowlanders of the forested montaña in this direction. Siesa relates that Huayna Capac, having established himself in Quito, took the offensive against tribes that remained hostile and that had built forts to protect themselves. In a subsequent confrontation with four other groups, including the Otalvos, Juana Capax's forces were saved from defeat by taking refuge in a fortress or pucar they had cons constructed. The enemy succeeded in breaching only the outer ramparts of this of the stronghold, described as being situated on a hill and guarded by no less than seven or eight rings of barriers. The Incas were thus able to defend themselves and to resume the offensive after the arrival of reinforcements. Siesa also reports that in proceeding southward from Ipiales, a few kilometers north of the, of the present border between Colombia and Ecuador, he came to a fortress near a place called Rumich Rumichaca, used by the Incas as, as a base for warfare, for warfare against the Pastos. This would seem to be more specifically definable as a frontier fortress. In their accounts of these hard-fought wars, Siesa and in somewhat greater detail Cabello and Sarmiento 
mention the use of fortified hilltops with the greatest frequency. In most cases, though, these can hardly be described as frontier posts, and it remains uncertain to what extent the Incas constructed permanent defenses on their long and often only temporary borders. Plaza Schuler located no less than 37 fortresses in the northern Ecuador Ecuadorian Andes, and of these, 15 are situated in the Ibarra Otavalo region. But according to Plaza Schuller, it is not very easy to determine the identity of the builders of such cons constructions. Both Inca and pre-Inca pottery have been found in these, in these sites, and Spanish sources insist that some were built by the Incas, though their layout is somewhat rudimentary. Plaza Schuller suggests that some of this pottery derives from provincial forces that served in the Inca campaigns in Ecuador, in particular those from Chucuito, on the shore of Lake Titicaca. The Sinews of War The ample storage facilities, the road network, and to some extent the fortresses all formed part of the imperial infrastructure and furthered the process of military conquest and, consolid and consolidation. But one further question arises. How, faced with the formidable problem of fighting at vast distances from their own base, did the Incas manage to vanquish so many peoples who bravely str struggled for their independence, faced no such problems of logistics, and endured no exhausting marches before reaching the field of battle? Success surely depended in part on taking the fullest advantage of this infrastructure to deploy much larger armies than their opponents could muster. Compulsory military service imposed on all males between the ages of 25 and 50 produced an ever-increasing flow of recruits from many regions as the empire expanded. These armies were, at least in theory, divided into units of 25, 100, 500, 1,000, and 10,000 men. These horses even mentioned units of 40,000 men, though it seems questionable whether in practice single units of such magnitude operated as part of an even larger force. The conquistadors themselves, both in Mexico and Peru, tend to offer highly implausible estimates of the numerical strength of the native armies vanquished by their own ex exiguous forces. By contrast with the skill and ingenuity the Incas devo devoted to their means of communication and methods of military de deployment, <clears throat> the actual weapons used by their armies did not constitute any advance over those of other Andean peoples and certainly did not impress the, Sp the Spaniards who marveled at their roads and buildings. Though the bow and arrow was known throughout the Andes, the Incas seldom availed themselves of this weapon. It was mainly used by tribes living near the Amazonic forests, against whom Inca triumphs were reportedly hollow. Among their principal weapons was the sling, a belt of wood or fiber that one twirled above the head before releasing with some force and accuracy a, fa a fairly large stone. Another favorite arm was the club, originally fashioned from stone and made in Inca times of hard jungle palm with, the he with a head of bronze, often fitted with sharp spikes, as can still be seen today in many museums and collections. They also employed wooden lances, but these were much shorter than those the Spaniards used to such effect against the native armies. The Inca armament hardly seems to represent a very major advance over that of the Mochicas, Whose, whose warriors, as depicted on their pottery, carried large clubs and used slings and spear throwers. Elizabeth Benson concludes that they also fought wars of conquest against their neighbors. She observes that they were apparently intent on taking prisoners, perhaps for sacrifice. Francisco de Chedes offers an eyewitness account of an Inca force. The forward troops carried slings, whereas those behind bore clubs and axes. Bows are not mentioned. The, sling these, these slings could cast stones about the size of an egg, and their users were protected by jackets of padded cotton. The, cl the clubs were about three feet long, a tip with about five or six me metal prongs about the size of a man's thumb. Behind those with clubs and slings f followed others with, l with, l with lances. Chérez describes the Inca armies as very well trained and commanded to a point that a mere th thousand men could overcome rebel or enemy forces, numbering 20,000. But Chérez's generous praise of Inca prowess hardly accords with his accounts of how the tiny band of Spaniards to which he belonged took a mere half hour to decimate the countless thousands of warriors in Atahuapa's escort when the ruler went to Cajanarca. Siesa does mention archers, but they seemingly had only a ceremonial role as part of the ruler's personal guard accompanied by a much larger force of troops equipped with slings and clubs. 
He further describes a typical large expedition heading into battle armed with, with slings, lances, and clubs, but does not mention bows. He relates how such a, f a force numbering 300,000 soldiers, a palpable exagger exaggeration, accompanied by a sizable retinue of camp followers and women to serve their needs, would proceed from Cusco and march in orderly fashion along the road from Tampu to Tampu, normally a day's journey apart. The inhabitants of the places through which they passed were obliged to serve the troops. The, la the latter were forbidden on pain of death to rob a single ear of corn or to molest the local women. As a consequence, good, re good relations were maintained between the army and the local population. Although Francisco de Chérez asserts that the Incas defeated their enemies in part because they were better trained, such training or discipline alone could hardly ensure automatic victory in, ba in battles against enemies armed with similar weapons. Shirley Gorenstein seeks to account for Inca military achievement more in terms of superior tactics. Their units cooperated as a single force to attain a common objective and to achieve surprise. They were also fully aware of the principle of concentration, the necessity of massing forces at a decisive point during an opportune phase of the campaign. Moreover, their elaborate storage system yielded the Incas to keep a large force in the field for a long period. The Incas were perhaps favored by the fact that they were nearly always on the offensive against opponents who, ad who adopted a, st a static defense, often based on fortified strongholds. Ever since the Chanka War, originally a defensive action, the Incas almost invariably pursued aggressive tactics. As an example, one may cite the defenders of the Kingdom of Timur, who far from attacking the rather vulnerable lines of communication between Cusco and Inca territory to the north of Timur, seemingly adopted a static defense based upon a resolve to protect their capital, Chan Chan. It may be conceded that the Incas, as the attacking force, were thus often but not always at an, adv at an advantage over their enemies, who were on the defensive. However, the, cr the chroniclers' reports, particularly Cabello de Baboa's account of the Ecuadorian wars, suggest that the Incas and their adversaries employed almost identical tactics, with both sides in many instances adopting a strategy based on fortified points and, ag and aggressive sorties. The Incas' success, then, may be in part attributed to another factor, the skill and determination of their high command. The initiation of the process of empire building might be ascribed to the inspired leadership of Pachacutec. His son, Tupac, was also a superlative commander, the range of whose conquests was staggering. Moreover, he and his successor were served by generals of undoubted ability. As we have seen, the highest command was basically the preserve of the, el of the elite of, C of Cusco, including Orejones, who were close relatives of the ruler. I take that back. I should have said, as we have seen, the high command was 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 basically the preserve of the elite of Cusco, including Orejones, who were close relatives of the ruler. But neither sound tactics nor competent leaders can altogether account for the Incas' dazzling record of victory against so many opponents. Their success in wars of conquest, extended into regions remote from the center, is perhaps more readily explained by their evident ability to, to deploy superior numbers by drawing on the manpower of an already extensive domain, many of whose peoples the Inca had managed to convert into dependable subjects. If the Inca forces faced a setback in Ecuador, they could use their road and message network to summon ample reserves of, say, Colas, or of many other loyal peoples from the rest of the empire. Their adversaries, hopelessly outnumbered and worn down by a stream of fresh levies, themselves had no means of replenishing their depleted strength. Hence, the Inca's military success might be said to have been due, at least in part, to their political skill in winning over conquered peoples, who, though formerly inveterate foes, would later prove willing to march huge distances to fight for the imperial cause. Moreover, Though some accounts may exaggerate the extent to which peoples would refrain from resisting the invaders, there seems little doubt that in some instances the Incas were able to achieve conquest more by skillful negotiation than by force. Certain doubts arise as to how far these large Inca forces formed part of a full standing army in the modern sense. Both historical sources and, m and modern auth authors make fairly frequent use of the word garrison. However, Trimborn, in writing of Incaracay, and, Sami, and Samaipata denies the existence of a standing army charged with the defense of such strongholds, stating that any quote-unquote garrison was in reality more a, a resident peasant colony. Siesa implies 
that at least in the Cusco region itself, warriors were mobilized for specific campaigns rather than kept permanently under arms. Whenever the need arose, the ruler would summon the provincial Curucas and command them to levy specified numbers of recruits for the coming expedition. Such a procedure presumably applied more to the earlier stages of imperial conquest. When the empire extended to remoter regions, forces could have been raised in other places as well as in Cusco. Ro, in reviewing data on the Inca military machine, also affirms that there was no standing army except for the imperial bodyguard. It should perhaps be added that Mura cites Espinosa Soriano as implying that the Aymara-speaking Charcas were full-time warriors, though the wording of this word of this report is somewhat ambiguous. The Ojorejones cons constituted a more regular force of officers and commanders, even if many also had non-military duties. However, it would seem that the ordinary soldiers were basically farmers who were liable for military service, admi admittedly for longish periods, rather than warriors with no other occupation, as in a modern standing army. The Inca Empire, unlike many old world empires, could maintain forts without the presence of a contingent of full-time soldiers because of the special features of the Miname system. As we have seen, Huayna Capac settled many Minames in the Cochabamba Valley, and if, as if, as Trimborn states, Inca Rakai was both a fort and a residence for farmers, then such loyal Minames would have offered not only sustenance but also security, able both to cultivate their new lands and to guard them in times of emergency. Siesta states that Minimes not only ensured the civil obedience of a new province in a general sense, but also restored order in times of crisis. For example, the eastern frontier regions, the home of recalcitrant tribes such as the, Ch the, Ch the Ch Chunchos, Mojos, and Chediwanos, were so far from Cusco that any emergency expedition would tend to arrive too late upon the scene. Locally resident Minimes could be used to man the fortress and to suppress sudden insurgencies. At the same time, in view of the distances involved in the duration of campaigns, Inca levies might at times have served for such a long period at, at stretch as to become almost full-time soldiers, even if that was not their official vocation. For such forces, military lodging, as well as storage of supplies, became part of the indispensable infrastructure. This concludes chapter 6.